I'm Bill Monvillian. I'm a lecturer at MIT, and you know every panel I introduce is always distinguished, but today's panel actually happens to be truly distinguished. Um, let me just briefly introduce them. You have bio detailed biomaterial on each um, in the online materials for this uh, for this gathering. Uh, first, David Hart is a senior fellow at ITIF, working on the energy area. Um, and is a professor of public policy at George Mason University and director of the Center for Science and Technology Policy there. Joe Heizer, next in our chain, is a principal at the Energy Futures Initiative. Um, he served as chief financial officer, CFO, and senior advisor to the Secretary of Energy uh, from 2013 to 2017. Um, Chris Smith is the Baker Institute Advisory Board Fellow in Energy Studies, and from 2014 to 2017, he served as the Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. And then, last but by no means least, is Sam Thurston, Founder and Executive Director of the Energy Innovation Reform Project. Uh, he was a Senior Climate Policy Advisor on the Clean Air Task Force, uh, from 2010 to 2012, and Director of Communications at the Council on Environmental Quality um, prior to that. So it is a very talented and distinguished group uh, with, I think, a lot of ideas on the important report from David and ITIF that's, that's uh, coming out today that we'll be discussing. Uh, David tells an old, a new part to an old story uh, the role of DOD in large-scale demonstrations. DOE. Uh, excuse me, DOE. <laughs> um, you know, the old story is a story that John Deutsch uh, told well of Sinfuel's demonstrations left behind um, by an oil price collapse in the 70s, 80s period. And David, in effect, has really updated the story to take a hard look at Department of Energy's efforts um, in a new round of demonstration projects largely coming out of <coughs> stimulus funding in a series of technology areas. Um, this is obviously an important stage in technological um, advance in the energy sector, and we're going to get a report card on what lessons have been learned. Thank you. Let me turn it over to David. Thank you, Bill. So it actually falls to me to introduce Bill because he soft sold himself. So Bill uh, is a member of the board here at ITF, as well as a lecturer at MIT and author of um, books on the topic of uh, energy innovation. So certainly uh, qualified to do far more than simply moderate the panel, and we look forward to hearing his remarks. Um, so thanks to the, uh, the panel that uh, came today and to you all for coming. I know you could be at home watching the Senate on C-SPAN. Uh, so I appreciate your pulling yourself away from that drama to, uh, to join us today. Uh, this paper started in somewhat more promising times. Um, in fact, if any of you were here for the October session we had, we were advertising a panel on this topic, um, but the election changed the, um, uh, the discussion somewhat. And at the moment, I don't think there is any immediate prospect for large-scale demonstration projects, although I've heard a few rumors to the contrary. Um, but even if there's no immediate prospect, it's still an important topic because I think if we're going to have large-scale change in our energy system, um, as many of us believe uh, is necessary to address the challenges of our time, especially uh, climate change, we're going to need more uh, demonstration projects. So I'm hopeful that there might be some more uh, federal spending on this uh, in the future, um, and uh, if not, um, immediately. Okay, so as Bill mentioned, um, the conventional wisdom, and I put um, Roger Noel and uh, Linda Cohen's book, The Technology Pork Barrel, a little cameo here in the upper left corner. Uh, Rob Atkinson, the president of ITF, absolutely hates this book. So uh, he mentioned it to me in that last night again. Uh, but still, it is, I think, the, the presiding wisdom in the field, which is that demonstration projects, especially big demonstration projects in this country, are doomed to failure, basically for a political reasons that um, after the money starts flowing to a particular locality, uh, regardless of what the technical results are, it's very hard to pull the plug on it. Um, and the poster child for that is illustrated on the left here, the Clinch River breeder reactor. That is a, um, an illustrated image of it because it never got built. Uh, about $5 billion was spent on it over 14 years, and it has not proven to be a viable technology. 
And I think mo most important, the failure of this project was clear long before the plant was shut down, and it kind of lived on as what I call the white elephant uh, before that. So this is what um, had been, at least in the academic literature, the conventional wisdom on demonstration projects. On the right, uh, we have the Petronova plant. So as Bill mentioned, this paper is about the Obama period, and they rejected that conventional wisdom or chose to ignore it. Um, and invested in a lot of demonstration projects, as I'll show you. <clears throat> and perhaps the most well-known success is this plant, which is in Texas. Uh, it's the largest coal-burning power plant in the country. And um, the project involved a retrofit of carbon capture uh, uh, system onto the plant, so uh, separating out carbon dioxide from um, the slipstream, and then transporting that carbon dioxide to an oil field and using it for enhanced uh, oil recovery. So this uh, project was finished on time, on budget, opened in January, and is capturing something on the order of a million tons of carbon dioxide a year, which is big. Uh, I believe it may be the biggest such project in the world. Um, and the D Department of Energy really was catalytic in getting it going. It made about 17 percent of the total investment, so a relatively small share. And the question is, is this kind of a new normal? Um, even though none of the kind of structural changes that uh, Cohen and Noel called for in their book were, were made. This was managed by, by DOE. So that's the question I would like the panel to um, discuss. And there's a number of other aspects in the paper, but I think this is the most important one. And my answer to it is that somewhere in between, there were some unique circumstances that helped these uh, projects succeed. Um, and maybe the problems that Cohen and Noel described weren't quite as bad as they made them out to be. Um, but I do think it's still worth thinking about alternatives to DOE for managing demonstration projects down the road. So we can come to that when we uh, have the discussion, I think. Okay, so let me run through the paper uh, quickly, and I look forward to you reading the details and sending me your comments um, by email. Um, so the first brief question I take, take up is why is there a need to have a demonstration stage in, uh, in innovation, and particularly in energy innovation? And this diagram isn't particularly important. It's just meant to, men, um, to give you the short answer to that question, which is complexity. Uh, many energy systems are very complex, and they don't perform the same way at a small scale as they do on a large scale. And so therefore, you need to build up the um, innovation process in the stages uh, at different scales until you reach full scale, uh, which is the demonstration phase, the first full, usually the first full scale uh, working facility of this type um, is what qualifies as, the, as a demonstration or maybe the first few uh, of a kind. Um, and I'll let the engineers on the panel talk about why it's the case. But the short answer to the reason why you need to demonstrate complex systems is that they're complex. And there's going to be bugs usually the first time around. And um, it's important to show that this thing can work in order to induce uh, investment in the next few. So in the IT sector, they say demo or die. And I think that's true in energy as well. In fact, um, this concept, valley of death, uh, has been applied to the demonstration phase. So I borrowed this diagram from my colleague uh, Jesse Jenkins, who's now at MIT. And the point of this part of the paper is to describe why the private sector is reluctant to invest in demonstrations. And the answer is that there's a lot of uncertainty, too much to induce investment. Um, whether it's the technology, whether it's the economics, um, as uh, uh, the dear departed, I guess he's not departed, he's just departed the scene, Donnie Rumsfeld talked about uh, known knowns and unknown, uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And much of the demonstration falls into the unknown, unknown category. And we don't have very good financial instruments to address that. And so there's a rationale for uh, government investment, uh, as well as the fact that, especially if we're talking about low carbon uh, innovations, there's going to be a public benefit if the technology is demonstrated uh, successfully. So um, the top of this diagram shows a few financial uh, institutions, venture capital, private equity, and so on, none of which really are well matched to the challenges of uh, demonstration. So that leads to this uh, so-called commercialization, Valley of Death, uh, which gives the paper its name, gives the panel its name, um, and that uh, justifies some government uh, role in, in demonstration. Um, perhaps not as much as far to the left, where you're talking about basic research and there's really no direct commercial benefit, uh, but, but more than uh, kind of a mature technology where the unknowns are known, and uh, we can price in the risk and figure out uh, uh, how to finance it. 
Um, again, the gory details of this argument are in the paper. So um, this uh, is just an illustration of that. So the best work on the topic recently is by Greg Nemet, and I would encourage all of you interested in this subject to consult his work. So he collected a data set of 511 projects from all around the world, from a wide range of industries, so not just energy, but also um, carbon intensive industries. And in uh, estimating the uh, 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 financial contributors to these projects, uh, they found that um, the vast majority of them had uh, uh, public investment, and most of them uh, more than half. So as you can see, the median public financing share of each project was 64%. So that's a pretty big, pretty big chunk. And what we'll see in the data on the Obama period is um, consistent from that. So not only is there a rationale for it, but um, when these projects actually do get built, it's very rare for them to be built entirely with private uh, funding. So most of my paper is about these projects I collected, and John Wu, who's here in the audience, where is John? There he is in the back, did a lot of the work to collect the data here, so thank you, um, John. Um, um, collected uh, data on these 53 projects that were um, initiated during the Obama administration. In fact, uh, all of them were initiated before 2011. Most of them, as Bill mentioned, were funded by the stimulus, of course, when the uh, Republicans took over the Congress in 2010, they were less than enthusiastic about funding additional projects, so that's why uh, most of them started in that period. Uh, there are eight technology categories here, but really it's fewer than that because three of these are carbon capture and storage. Uh, the top advanced clean coal is carbon capture and storage for coal. Then you have also industrial carbon capture and storage. And then Future Gen, which is a standalone very large project, we'll talk, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute, it's kind of the mega the most mega of all the projects uh, on the list, as you can see from the, from the numbers here. Um, we struggled with the definition of demonstration project, and in the end we just took a very simple approach, and that was whatever de DOE called the demonstration project, we called the demonstration project. So uh, there's room for academic analysts to, uh, to improve on this uh, work. So this is a preliminary pass through this uh, topic, I think. Uh, as you can see, all these projects were, were cost-shared. Uh, there's a wide variety of scales, so not all of them would necessarily fit the model that Cohen and Noel are talking about, uh, but some of them do. Uh, similarly, John Deutsch's work on demonstration projects is about really big projects, so not all of these projects fall into that uh, category. Um, the right-hand side is the money allocated, not necessarily spent. So we spent some time, and, and John, bless his uh, soul, dug around for a long time trying to find actual spending data on the projects, and we weren't able to get an actual number for what was spent. Uh, but so, for instance, on the Future Gen project, only about $120 million was actually spent by the federal government on that project, so far short of the number on the screen. So this indicates intention uh, more than actual expenditure. Um, and similarly with the, 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 the federal project share, this was the uh, project share at the beginning of the project, not necessarily. Some of the projects were withdrawn or cut short, uh, not, uh, so not necessarily the actual spending dollars. But as you can see, the numbers are right around 50%, and there's a reason for that, as I'll, as I'll talk about. Uh, you'll also note that there's no nuclear projects here, also no solar projects. Um, now, these were, there was uh, loan program support for those projects which are more mature, but that may be something, the sort of nature of this portfolio that the panel wants to take up. Um, and the solar projects on the loan, and the loan program included both utility scale PV and concentrating uh, solar power. But that is just sort of one step down the maturity um, uh, curve than, than this phase, the demonstration phase that I'm talking about here. So the analytical work of the paper was first to develop these five principles and then apply them to those 53 projects. So what I'm going to walk through now very briefly is what I found in thinking about these five uh, principles, which are drawn from Nemitz's work, from other work, uh, as well as from theory about uh, uh, innovation. Um, so so kind of 53 times five, that's the, that's the data set uh, of the paper, so to speak. Um, so the first one, and this was Cohen and Noel's big problem, was that the projects would be uh, uh, subject to political um, uh, forces. Um, my wife said, are you really going to put that slide up? And I said, yeah, but I don't, I don't want you to read this. It's not meant to be text. It's, think of this text as an illustration, um, and it's meant to signify the uh, technical uh, effort that went into selecting projects. So I actually think the Obama administration did a pretty good job of selecting projects and keeping politics out of it. So this is just a little piece of the um, FOA, the funding announcement for the wind program. 
Um, a set of criteria were developed, and as far as I know, and perhaps uh, others have further inside knowledge, but as far as I know, the criteria were applied uh, as fairly as possible to select projects. Uh, there is one glaring exception, and that's the future gen project. So this is a project that was begun under George W. Bush. Um, at that time, it was even more complicated than the vision under Obama, um, and that uh, was shut down by the Bush administration in 2008. Uh, it happened to be in Illinois. There happened to be a certain senator from Illinois running for president at that time, and uh, lo and behold, it reappears in the stimulus package. Um, and as you can see, technology review said rises from the dead. So we can see this as kind of a, 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 a paradigm, uh, a, the, the, tech, the tech, technology pork barrel uh, paradigm playing itself uh, out there. Uh, and yet, in 2015, that project was killed, as I mentioned, far before it uh, spent a billion dollars. And some of the folks that were involved in that are here on the panel, so they may want to comment on that. Um, so from that point of view, I think I, I, I would characterize that even, even though the project rose from the dead, um, perhaps, and I'm not qualified to comment on the technical merits of the project. I did speak to some folks that believed in this project very strongly, felt it was unfairly killed. But at least it's possible for the DOE to kill off a really big project and not um, succumb to whatever congressional pressure, or in this case, I don't know if there was presidential pressure, but there could have been, to keep it going. So that's uh, overcoming that technology pork barrel uh, syndrome. Um, on cost sharing, so this is just a piece of the same table I showed you uh, before. Um, in theory, what we would want on these projects is a kind of negotiation of the risk, right? Um, that there should be some private benefit and the, the, the investors, the, the private partners in this should be able to figure out what they're going to get out of the project and invest accordingly and then the public uh, takes up the rest. Um, but in practice, we have statutory uh, cost shares, 50 percent, in most cases, 70 percent in some cases, and not surprisingly, the people that bid on these projects put together proposals that say, hey, we're going to get 50 percent of the cost from the government. Um, so um, uh, Petronova, as I mentioned, was only 17 percent, uh, but it's really um, a longer story than that. The original proposal was 50 percent, and then the project developers expanded the project tremendously. Um, and what was really exceptional there was they didn't come back to the federal government to ask for the money to expand the project, uh, but in fact they wound up going to Japanese sources and particularly government connected sources because Mitsubishi was the primary vendor for that project and I, I guess that that's why uh, Japanese banks and um, government affiliated financial institutions were willing to support it. So I think the Petronova project is very consistent with a sort of statutory driven cost sharing model. As I understand it, the Secretary of Energy does have some discretion. I don't know how realistic it is to expect the Secretary to exercise it, but I think it would be better for these projects to have a little bit more flexibility and negotiate out the cost share rather than to be stuck with something uh, that's mandated or um, dictated from uh, Congress. Well, future gen I know was a very complicated arrangement. I think it did move around over time. Um, I think in most cases, I, I don't know exactly how the, the spending was organized, so I don't know exactly when the money came in. Um, now, most of them were completed, so it was kind of beside the point. Uh, but I don't know for the ones that were finished whether they spent more on the front end from the public uh, end. I don't know the answer to that. Um, okay, so that's the second one. Uh, third, um, so it's important to involve all the players in a value chain. Uh, in demonstration projects, and again, um, the text here is just meant to be illustrative that the most of the project under the Obama administration did have teams that involved um, vendors, involved end users. Um, in the case of this smart grid project, the Pacific Northwest smart grid project involved municipal utilities as well as commercial uh, investor-owned utilities. So, um, so I think in most cases this uh, criterion was pretty well uh, satisfied. Uh, the other project I mentioned up here is the um, battery project, which was at uh, No Trees in Texas. So this was a big wind farm, which um, the federal uh, government invested in a battery uh, system that would um, deal with the variable output of that wind farm. Um, and that was owned by Duke Power, which is what you would want. You want the end user to actually be practicing the technology because once it gets to its commercial phase, the, the end users are going to be practicing the technology. Um, and then they work with some vendors. And in this case, the vendor actually turned over and uh, the, the, the battery technology that they 
used didn't work out very well, and they replaced it later on. Um, so on this criterion, I think also that these projects did uh, pretty well. Information sharing, here there was a lot more variability across the programs. Um, in my view, and again, I think building on Greg Nemitz's work, um, the information sharing component of demonstration is really important. What you're trying to do is uh, show the potential future buyers of this technology that, you know, it can perform uh, uh, economically, it can perform technologically, so that means uh, sharing data. Uh, now, there's a trade-off there, of course, for the, um, the performer of the specific demo project. They may have a lot of value in that data, so the more you require them to open up the data, the more you weaken their investment uh, incentive. So there is a, there is a trade-off there that has to be reckoned with, but I would err on the side of openness, I think, rather than um, proprietary data. And you can see here uh, the, the paradigm of open data in this group was the geothermal um, program, so basically opening up, as, I, uh, as best I could understand it, everything that they generated from the demo projects. And then you can see in the advanced wind program, and there were a number of other programs like this, uh, the um, project performer was allowed to keep the, the data proprietary for five years, uh, which is a pretty long time, um, depending on, you know, which energy sector you're looking at. Um, so on that one, I was uh, more critical, I think, of the um, Obama experience. And then the last one, um, this is the idea that you should invest in projects where there's going to be some kind of follow-on market, right? You don't want to create demonstration projects that demonstrate something that's not commercial at the end. Uh, this turns out to be really hard to do, and as Bill mentioned, uh, the Synthetic Fuel Corporation ran into this in 1979 when the price of oil was really high. Um, so the uh, um, patron saint of uh, academia, Yogi Berra, is pictured here with his uh, philosophical saying, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Um, if you, you know, had predicted the price of oil and gas over the last 15 years, you really shouldn't be sitting here. You should be sitting on your yacht somewhere in the Caribbean. Um, so it's very hard to do if you're uh, going to fund technologies, you know, five years, ten years in advance of when they're going to come into the market. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, so uh, this is just a quote from the paper itself. There were some technologies that I think were rapidly taken up by the commercial sector, uh, especially the smart grid uh, technologies. Um, others are still dependent on uh, government support. Um, can, I, can we blame the project selection for that? I, I think not. I just think it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, but there are certainly people that would argue um, on certain of these technologies that they're just not viable. So, um, so we can talk about that uh, as well. So that's the core of the paper. And again, I'm happy to engage with folks that want to dig into the uh, gory details. Um, so back to my original question, you know, should DOE continue to be the, the main um, uh, manager of demonstration projects? I, I'm a little more hopeful after reviewing the Obama experience than I would have been after just reading Cohen and Noel and some of the follow-on work that looked at the 1970s and 1980s, which was the last time that the U.S. had a big energy demonstration uh, program. Um, how much of this was luck? I think in Petronova there was a fair amount of luck involved. Um, so some combination of skill uh, and luck. Um, I think it might be worthwhile to have some more options on the table, especially for the very large projects like the future gen uh, type projects. And that's where John Deutsch's idea of setting up a government uh, uh, owned corporation that would be uh, relatively autonomous in its um, approach. Richard Lester and I have uh, laid out a scheme for having regional demonstration projects. Now, this doesn't mean that DOE would be out of the business altogether. I just think these would be options for managing particular types of projects. That said, it's really hard to get anything new, A, established, and B, set up. Um, so, um, so if we're left with DOE as the main option, I think we should feel more encouraged from this period um, than we would have uh, a few years before. So the last slide. So these are my conclusions, um, and I haven't dealt with all of them here, but hopefully given you the, the overview of them. Um, we need to have a, a, a robust uh, demonstration portfolio, which we don't have uh, right now, in my view. Um, it's important to have uh, federal, uh, public, and private partners in these uh, projects, uh, but the private partners should be the leading, uh, uh, leading the projects, you know, actually implementing the projects. Um, information sharing should be a higher priority, as I mentioned. Um, I haven't talked about this, but there are some projects that jumped from, 
you know, a, a relatively small scale straight up to the demonstration scale. Now, the best example of that is the camper plant, which isn't in my data set. It was actually funded uh, before in the George W. Bush administration. But that, as I understand it, went roughly 100x of the previous uh, 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 scale. So, and that has been um, uh, a failure, as some of you may know. This is a carbon capture and sequestration plant in, in Mississippi. Um, be prepared to terminate projects, again, addressing the, the Cohen and Noel concern. Consider alternatives to DOE and encourage uh, other agencies like the Department of Defense, Department of Transportation, uh, where, their, where their equities are engaged to, um, to support these kinds of projects. Uh, so, uh, so that's the paper and outline. Um, I look forward to hearing uh, the discussion. And again, thanks you all for coming out on such a beautiful day. So we're going to turn now to our distinguished panelists. And we'll um, you know, head down the, the chain here. So first is Joe Heizer. And Joe, let me hand you the clicker. I think, need to, I think Joe needs to speak from the podium. I, mean, I need to speak from the podium. Okay. Just for that purpose of the web files. Thanks, Bill. And uh, th thank you, David. I, I just want to say here in, in uh, uh, opening up, I, I think that the work that, uh, that David did was a very solid analytical piece of work on a very um, complex and sometimes very highly politicized uh, topic. And so I think it really adds a lot of value to, uh, uh, to the discussion. Um, and so what I want to do is basically just uh, say that I, I think that, that the results in terms of the conclusions and recommendations that, that in his paper I think are very sound and I think deserve a lot of consideration. And if anything, I want to present a few ideas that would even take some of his ideas and take them a, a step further. So I have uh, just three slides here that I want to show if I can Take figure out arrow. how to do this. It's not doing it. get a little help there. But basically, I want to just make, in, in my comments right now, I just want to make two points. Uh, the first is um, I want to make the point that there really is an important federal role in the demonstration stage of the innovation process, but that that role really should be one that's defined and determined based on an analytical process and not purely on an, on an ideological process. And then the second point I want to make, again, going back to, to David's work, is that in thinking about these design principles and uh, recommendations for going forward, I think there's some further things that could be done, and I want to just highlight a few of those. So in this first chart here, and I think there's a version of this, I think, in, in David's paper, actually, just want to point out that the innovation process, I think, for those of you who study it, understand this as a very interactive and complex process. It's not a linear process. And in fact, demonstration projects and commercialization projects play a very important role in that process, not only in moving things forward from going from science and, and research, but also it's an important feedback loop because what's learned in the demonstration stage oftentimes can have very important implications for how one plans more of the basic um, and applied research programs. And I think the issue that we're, we're dealing with now, particularly in this administration and in the budget proposals that were put forward uh, by the administration for FY18, is some thinking that goes back to, uh, quite frankly, goes back to the Reagan years, because I was there at the time, actually. I was at OMB when this was first uh, uh, policy was enunciated about the government's role is in, you know, early stage basic research and that applied research development and demonstration was a private sector role. And I think David's point is well taken that there needs to be a partnership here, but it has to be a partnership. It, it, it cannot be a complete handoff. And when you think about the interaction in the innovation process, that there, there is a very important role for the government to actually stay in that process and through the very end until commercialization. Second slide I want to show here is an example of this. 
This is a, uh, a chart from a, a project that I worked on at MIT, the Future of Natural Gas Study, where we looked at the evolution of um, unconventional or shale gas development in the U.S. And it's a very interesting pattern here that when you go, and it goes back to the 1970s to some early work that was uh, funded by the Department of Energy that was primarily focused on uh, resource characterization when we really began to understand just how much natural gas we had in shale resources in the Appalachian region and other part and in the western regions of the U.S. And at the same time, we understood that using conventional technology, um, it would be completely uneconomic to recover that gas. And then as time progressed, um, there was uh, industry funding as new technologies was developed for uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic uh, fracturing that marrying those two technologies together could indeed provide the key to unlocking this res resource. And in fact, in this case, there were some field demonstrations that were funded, but in this case it was not funded by DOE, but rather by the, uh, on this chart shows up as GRI, the Gas Research Institute, which was an industry group that was funded through a surcharge on interstate natural gas um, uh, pipeline transportation. And so that act as, acted as this, the substitute or the alternative, the government funding, that did the early field demonstrations that proved out the concept. And at the same time, there was a some follow-on work that, and again, I think David alluded to this, that, that if you're going to do the demonstration, is there going to be a follow-on policy? In this case, there was. There was something called the uh, non-conventional fuels uh, tax credit. And so that tax credit existed to uh, spur further deployment of technologies such as um, unconventional natural gas. And so as the demonstrations proved technically successful, the tax credit, which was a time-limited tax credit, provided the incentive for early deployment. And then with early deployment, then the learning process took over, and we began to see the industry making gains in terms of increased productivity, lower costs, and actually, as time went on, better environmental uh, management practices. And the uh, production of uh, unconventional gas really took off. And so I think this is an example of how these various pieces, both the research piece, the demonstration piece, and the other policy incentives fit together in a way that really uh, advances the, uh, uh, a new technology in a, in, a, in a whole new area. So the last chart I just want to show is some additional ideas that I wanted to put forward to this group and to the panel today for uh, additional, if you will, design principles that, uh, that David referred to. And I base these in part based on my own experience having worked on some of these issues going back to the days of Sinfuels when I was on the OMB staff at that time to the days when I was the DOE uh, uh, CFO dealing with uh, uh, a lot of these uh, demonstration projects and uh, project management. So I just want to kind of highlight a couple of issues. The first is David refers to the issue of uh, political insulation. Um, I, refer, I prefer to refer to it in a more genteel way and call it policy risk. And so <laughs> A lot of these demonstrations suffer not only from technical issues and cost issues, but <clears> clearly <throat> there's policy risk and there's also uh, market risk that we haven't. David mentioned it briefly, but I wanted to stress that because some of these demonstration projects that ran into problems ran into both policy risk and market risk. In particular, Clinch River, for example, uh, the issue there was that the Carter administration changed policies in terms of reprocessing in the U.S., but at the same time, there was an underlying market change in terms of the economics of uh, uranium fuel development, which made reprocessing less attractive as an economic uh, uh, proposition. Likewise, with synthetic fuels, uh, there was a policy shift in the Reagan administration, but at the same time, the decontrol of oil markets resulted in a significant drop in the market price of oil, making these projects very far out of the market. And even the case with Kemper, which uh, David mentioned at the end of his presentation, we have both 
market risk in terms of uh, significant reduction in the price of natural gas relative to the assumption that was made at the time the project was planned, as well as the policy risk in that we don't have a carbon management policy that really puts an adequate uh, price on carbon to encourage uh, carbon capture. The point I wanted to make here is that um, the typical financial instruments that we use for demonstration projects, which are cost sharing or in some cases uh, loan guarantees, don't adequately or are, are good levers, if you will, to address some of the market risks. And so we probably need to be thinking about more flexible uh, financial tools uh, to deal with those uh, risks. The second thing I want to point out is greater funding certainty. Some of these projects um, were funded incrementally through annual appropriations, and so consequently there was an annual battle over what the funding level would be, and if the funding was not provided at the same level as requested, the project had to be rebaselined. It had to be, you know, the cost and schedule estimates would change. Uh, fortunately, in the case of a lot of the um, uh, Recovery Act projects that uh, David uh, looked at in his database, a lot of those were fully funded at the time, so there was funding certainty. The Synthetic Fuels Corporation had funding certainty. And so given that, it, it took the funding uncertainty risk out of the equation so that you could focus more on technical cost and, and market uh, issues. Uh, and, and so again, in thinking about what a future demonstration program might be, uh, we need to think very carefully about funding certainty. Thirdly, uh, based on, again, my experience, particularly now as CFO and, and doing some of the work we were doing in terms of major project management, um, I, I've sort of come to the conclusion that there's more commonality in <coughs> project management of demonstration projects then there is commonality among fuel type or energy type. So right now, DOE manages each demonstration project within its individual organizational silo, whether it's nuclear energy, fossil energy, solar, et cetera, et cetera. But when you think about some of the issues that have to be dealt with in terms of demonstration projects, it would, in my view, would be very important to have a single organizational and management oversight structure that would apply to those because there's a lot of common issues there that need to be addressed. And in particular, I wanted to point out that one of the things that we worked on um, a great deal during the Obama administration was improving the project management of DOE direct funded projects. For example, you know, the DOE cleanup projects and DOE uh, uh, national security projects. Um, DOE's had its own share of issues with managing large-scale projects, and we've done a lot to try and reform the project management process. And, um, and a lot of those reforms were codified in something called DOE Order 413.3B. And there was a lot of interesting requirements in that order, I think, that could also apply to government-financed uh, demonstration projects that are being executed by the private sector including things like independent cost estimates and even simple things like design before you construct, comprehensive risk assessment, scale up. And actually one other thing I didn't put on the slide that was a new factor that we put into the DOE project process was the commissioning phase. Because oftentimes when you build these first of a kind projects, there are many, many issues during the commissioning phase and, and things don't go very quickly or simply from construction to operation. And I think there needs to be better planning for that. The next point I would make is that needs to be in the design principles is, is an exit strategy in all these projects. And, and again, David's, David's presentation alluded to it. And you notice here I left that one blank because, I, frankly, I'm not sure I have any good ideas for how one executes that. But clearly, there needs to be some process to, to exit when things are not going well or when things change significantly. And then last but not least, the point I want to make, and again, I think this is just reinforcing a point that David made, is that in planning demonstration projects and executing them, we need to be thinking about follow-on support. What happens next? And clearly, things like the loan guarantee program in DOE, uh, things like follow-on tax incentives, even uh, limited time tax incentives, and, and even things like where the government can be a customer, an early customer for some of these technologies, 
are all things I think would be very important factors to consider to make the demonstration project more successful by ensuring that it will have a, uh, a follow-on. So with that, again, I would just want to compliment uh, David and the work that the team has done on this report and hopefully uh, lead to um, a lot of interesting uh, discussion and some follow-on considerations. Thank you. Joe, thanks very much. Let's now turn to Chris Smith. Well, um, <coughs> first of all, uh, thanks, Bill, for, for convening this group and, and David for a really interesting and informative uh, report. You and I had an opportunity to, to speak a few times, so I finally get to, to meet you face to face and, and see some, some interesting results. And thank you for sharing what you know. Indeed, well, thanks. Um, so this is a, it's a really an interesting topic. It's, it's tremendously important, I think. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll spend just a couple minutes reiterating some of the comments that have been made by by previous uh, uh, previous panelists. You know, here that I'm going going third. Uh, certainly, these are these are difficult challenges. So I, I came to the administration back in 2009 uh, from the private sector, and you know, coming from the private sector to government and managing issues like this, you suddenly get a, a crash course in this issue of of insulating your project from politics, which you know you don't have that same sort of issue in, in the private sector. So it's a, it's a, it's a unique, unique challenge. In fact, uh, you know, sitting next to my, my friend here, uh, Joe Heizer, who was a CFO when I was assistant secretary, uh, brings back a, a few flashbacks. Uh, some of them <laughs> somewhat unpleasant, right? Um, but it's a it's it's a it's a it's a real challenge. Um, and I, I think maybe perhaps in the discussion we'll get an opportunity to talk about some of the the um, the specific things that 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 we dealt with in, in these projects, but um, I'll, I'll comment just very briefly on on some of the the projects that I managed. So I was assistant secretary for fossil energy, so I had the uh, all the demonstrations for carbon capture and sequestration. So I had the the Kemper project, the NRG project, uh, Future Gen, uh, a few others. So when I was assistant secretary, someone would ask me about Kemper, and my response would be, "Well, let me tell you about NRG." Because uh, that was, you know, the, it was called the, the tail of two project. But now, you know, I get to talk a little bit about about Kemper, and I, and I, I do want to spend a, a minute uh, uh, talking about that. Uh, David, you mentioned the um, the technological challenge of, of Kemper. So they they essentially um, took a this trig gas fire that was developed by the National Energy Technology Laboratory and scaled it up significantly. And you've got you've got real challenges there in terms of materials handling, in terms of uh, in terms of systems, in terms of, of, of processing. So if you go back and you talk to the folks out at, at NETL who worked on that project, you, you know, they're actually really excited about the technical things that you learned here. Um, at the same time, and, and those things, those benefits reveal themselves sometimes in unexpected ways. Like there's, um, you know, a lot of the work that we did in fluidized beds, for example, the NOFS Fossil Energy, then become relevant when you're looking at the, the concept of using fluid, fluidized beds to deal with incinerating uh, nuclear waste. I mean, they're, they're cross, uh, um, uh, cross utilization of some of the technologies that emerge as you're developing them, and some of them are, are, are unexpected. But certainly, as you look at the Kemper project, um, uh, and, and uh, David, you talked a bit about luck, and, and Joe, you talked about market risk. Uh, you know, the story of Kemper really is looking at the expectation for that project when it was conceived and then looking at this, uh, the subsequent development of the market. And, you know, the Southern Company, if you, you go into the Southern Company's headquarters, and they're the ones who, who did the Kemper project, they, they hand you the corporate biography. It's this book called Big Bets, and it talks about the Southern Company's philosophy for, for taking these audacious bets, for doing big projects, for doing things that other companies won't do. And their business model at the time was, A, there was going to be an, an immediate driver to drive down greenhouse gas emissions, which I think is, is still very much the case. Um, and number two, that um, we're running out of natural gas, and here's an opportunity to take this low-rank lignite, turn it into syngas by innovating these, uh, these large-scale gas fires, and use that syngas to run the turbines. Um, and they end up you know, running into the same buzzsaw as a lot of industry players ran into. And I was at I was at Chevron when Chevron was working on the Sabine Pass LNG terminal when that was an LNG import terminal because the idea was that we needed lots more natural gas. And certainly, as that market flipped, it upended uh, Kemper's uh, business model. Uh, now, on top of that, there were some other challenges with that with that project. I think the the systemic complexity uh, of the project was 
probably the so the southern company had had, had underestimated it. Um, so that was a project that certainly had some some enormous uh, challenges, and you know, southern company ended up writing off uh, you know, billions of dollars on that project. Um, if you look at the NRG project, it kind of ran in the opposite direction in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, you mentioned the the relatively low cost share um, uh, for for NRG, and you know the you know one of the fortuitous things that happened with NRG is is you know as they looked at as they did the front end engineering design for the project because it was initially going to be you know a sixty megawatt capture project. Uh, they're taking that CO2, they're capturing it instead of putting it into the environment, they're compressing it, putting it into a pipeline, and sending it into a depleted oil field to enhance that field. Um, when they looked at how much CO2 they needed for that project, they realized they needed a lot more CO2 to get an appropriate miscible flood in that field than they'd get out of 60 megawatts. So they quadrupled uh, the size of the, the, of the, of the project. Uh, and David, in, in your comment, you said that they didn't, you know, they didn't come back. The great things they didn't come back for the, to the federal government for more money. They actually did come back to the federal government, but we didn't have any more money. And we said no, right? So, so certainly, I mean, companies will endeavor, you know, to get help where they where where, where they where they where they can. Uh, but in this case, where they hey, we don't have any more money, uh, and they were able to do some other things, and get that project up and going. So they were, they took on uh, first. I think they took on the right challenge. Uh, they did a project that they were capable of of, of, of executing. Uh, the market, in some ways, didn't do them a lot of favors either, because you know when we kicked that project off, we were looking at you know ninety dollar oil, and the value of the project is taking that CO two, and taking a, a, a field that produces around five hundred barrels and turning it to a field that produces around fifteen thousand barrels, and so the value of the oil then uh, covers the, pro the the cost of the capex to to capture the CO two. Uh, so as oil markets came down, certainly the the profitability of that of that of that project was was challenged. Uh, but the other thing is the the exciting thing about going to that to that site was you walk around the site with the field and with the engineers who built the plant, and you know you're there with your hard hat and your your boots on, and they can point to ten things they'll do next time that will peel off five percent here, ten percent here, thirty percent here. So by actually building these projects, you get better at doing them, and, and I think that's a tremendously important. Um, uh, uh, step in order to make sure that the, the technologies are, are eventually commercialized. Um, we're going to need these projects. Uh, you know, speaking specifically about the carbon capture and, 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 and sequestration, uh, these projects are going to be important when you're looking at decarbonizing our, uh, our economy of deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. 30% um, of the electricity we generate is still generated based on uh, on coal. And so if you care about energy security, if you care about stability of the grid, if you care about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, dealing with the, the, the fuel of the current day is going to be, continue to be extremely important. Uh, coal and CCS has some, has a unique challenge that is a little bit different than pioneering other clean energy technologies. If you have a, you know, if you have a coal plant with CCS, it competes against a coal plant without CCS. And so right now we have a, you know, a regulatory scheme where you can emit as much CO2 in the environment as you want to, and it's essentially free. So the, the, the plant with CCS is going to lose to the plant without CCS if you're comparing you know, apples to apples in terms of uh, the levelized cost of electricity. Uh, the thing that makes the, CO, the, the project at Kemper work, obviously, is the fact that you're take, using that CO2 uh, for enhanced oil recovery. So you are getting some, some recovery of, of, of uh, or some enhanced value out of the CO2. But understanding utilization is going to continue to be important. And eventually, you know, right in, in, the, in the current day, continuing to build these plants so that you drive it down the cost are going to be important for a time in the future when we do have a, a cost on carbon. Uh, so again, I, I appreciated your you know, the, the report. I think uh, we, we should have, a, I think, an interesting uh, conversation here about, I guess, the future of demonstrations. So thanks, and thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Chris. Let me turn to Sam Thurstrom. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, great conversation so far, and I, I would definitely, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read David's paper yet, I, I would highly commend it to all of you. I think it's a great paper. I think it asks a lot of really important questions. Um, if I have a complaint of it, as I've suggested to David, I think uh, that I want to get us, I hope we can get closer to answers on these questions. And I think the paper starts 
you know, down that road, and I think we've heard a lot of good suggestions as well. Um, I won't provide those answers. I don't claim to have them, but I, I do think these are really important questions, and I hope maybe, you know, a year or two from now, maybe we'll be further down the road with this dialogue. We can come back with another version of this report that gets us closer to answers on all these things, because I do think these are important issues. Um, you know, maybe I would start by quoting what I think is the most important sentence in the report, just so you all have it in your mind. David writes that energy demonstration projects are expensive, difficult, and prone to failure. We, we, we've seen, you know, we've discussed that some this morning, um, but that we also need them. They're really crucial to actually having better options for our energy system. And if you'll forgive me, indulge a parochial moment here. This report was released by my organization yesterday. There's a couple of people here who are at the event. Um, we're looking at the potential uh, costs of advanced nuclear reactors once they're fully commercialized. These aren't first-of-a-kind reactors. They're fully commercialized. We're suggesting that they could be half the cost of current nuclear technologies today. Um, and that would obviously have a totally transformative effect on our, on our energy system if those technologies were available. So the question is, how do we get from here to there? And I do think these demonstration projects are important. Um, you know, I agree with a lot of the recommendations that David does offer, and I, and I would highlight in particular the need for these robust demonstration programs. Uh, some form of federal cost sharing, which I think, as I'll talk about a bit, is, is difficult. Um, and I also have long been a proponent of some co-investment from other federal agencies, such as DOD in particular, I, you know, I'm less firm on DOT, but I like the DOD suggestion a lot. Uh, and in particular, because DOD is not only a place where you can demonstrate these technologies, but it is also, as I think someone alluded to, potentially a first customer for these. You can have purchase power agreements. You can actually draw these past the demonstration phase into the commercialization process, which I think is really important. Um, having praised the paper to start with, I'll maybe offer some uh, critiques as well, if I, if I may. Um, you know, I think the most important point, one that we've talked about a fair bit already, is the, need, is the desire to insulate these programs from politics um, and the real challenge of doing that. So, you know, let's, yes, let's work on it, but let's keep our expectations in that area um, modest. Um, in particular, the idea of these uh, alternative institutional arrangements that have been suggested, whether it's uh, uh, the Deutsch idea of, of this government-funded corporation or Richard Lester's proposal. I think these are very interesting ideas, but at the end of the day, I think it's hard to be clear on whether they could happen, and this environment seems pretty unlikely, um, and also whether or not they could even be done. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think we have the appetite for these things. I think uh, regionalizing an issue that is really a federal problem, as uh, has been suggested as one approach, is, is moving things in the wrong direction. Uh, these are these really are you know big technology demonstration projects with huge capital costs. Very difficult to do them at a regional or state basis. Uh, I would suggest that we should look more in the other direction of more likely internationalizing rather than regionalizing these things. And I think that it is a common mistake of Americans to have this, you know, focus on things that are solely within our borders when these uh, energy issues, environmental issues, and technology issues are all very much international. Um, I would also just urge some caution in the idea that another agency is necessarily going to be better than DOE. Um, I've written quite critically about DOE and its problems and in managing these projects, and I've suggested some broad-reaching reforms for DOE. Um, you know, the question I would suggest to all of you is, you know, if ARPA-E, for instance, is a better model for DOE, should we be trying to create more ARPA-Es that are free from the institutional arrangements of DOE itself? Or should we be trying to ARPAize DOE? I think we're more likely to make DOE an effective organization than we are to spin out some new, you know, corporation or something that would take on DOE's responsibilities. And I don't, I wouldn't suggest that either one is easy, but I, I would focus more on how do we fix our existing institutions rather than hoping that we might have uh, some new ones come along. Similarly, I think we should uh, be looking at the national labs and whether there's ways to make them you know, more cost effective, more uh, private sector focused. Uh, it's been a longstanding complaint of a lot of people that the labs are doing science for science's sake um, and that uh, DOE headquarters micromanages the labs in a lot of ways that they weren't intended to originally. So there's 
you know, for 15 or 20 years, people have been talking about taking the labs back to their original model of GOCO, government-owned, contractor-operated, where the labs would be given more grand technology challenges and more freedom in how to actually pursue those um, those goals. And I think, again, I would suggest that, that, that maybe that's a better way to be thinking about these things than hoping that there's going to be some new institutions. Another kind of main point I want to highlight that I think the paper brings out nicely is just the real difficulty of measuring success on these projects. You know, so as David's um, opening remarks suggested, is, uh, you know, should we think of sin fuels today as a terrible pork barrel or as a project that actually advanced a lot of important science that I think we're learning from still in some ways, and the same could be said for Clinch River. Um, maybe we spent billions of dollars at Clinch River beyond the point that we should have, but the question of whether we should be closing the nuclear fuel cycle and having breeder reactors, I, I think, is still very much before us as a public policy question. And so, you know, down the road, people may find that some of those Clinch River billions weren't so badly spent necessarily. Um, similarly, you know, I served, as, as Bill mentioned, I served in the George W. Bush administration, so, um, you know, lest anyone think that I'm only throwing stones to the Obama administration for their challenges in this space, let's take off just a few of the things that we did in the Bush administration. The Future Gen project has been mentioned, you know, it was on, it was off, it was on again, then it was off again. Um, you know, a lot of that was on us, um, but Future Gen isn't the only one. Obviously, we, uh, we had a big push for what we called freedom fuel, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and developing the fueling infrastructure for that. Sitting here right now, that looks pretty silly, right? But Toyota's does have a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle that they have produced and I don't know, another 10, 20 years down the road, we might think that hydrogen was a good area to have made some investments in. Uh, same story on stelliolostic ethanol. Again, Bush administration, big push there. I think it looks pretty stupid today. Come back and ask me again in 10, 20 years, I might t tell you something totally different. So while we have this desire to not waste money, cut off projects when they're not, you know, producing, the basic question of is a project a success or a failure is actually very difficult to answer, um, especially in a timely fashion. On the question of cost sharing, uh, David has suggested we should have more flexible cost sharing arrangements to accommodate the different risk profiles of these projects. Amen. How do we do it? I don't know. I really don't. Um, Obviously, projects that have more risk are further from commercialization. Therefore, there's a better case for government involvement in it. But David also says he only wants us to fund demonstration projects where there's a good chance of follow-on private sector investment. The greater the chance there is of, of investment, the closer it is to successful commercialization, the less case there is for federal <laughs> funding. This is a dynamic that is it's very difficult to unwind. So. I, I thought Joe's comments about uh, how we should be making analytical decisions, not ideological ones, are obviously on point. Uh, I would just emphasize the challenge of making analytical decisions that are robust and, uh, you know, objective. Um, so, and on this question of, you know, terminating pork barrel projects early, uh, you know, same, same storyline. Again, I would say we all agree that unsuccessful demonstration projects should be terminated, but the question is what is the policy process that should be used to do that? And you know, Chris and I talked just a little bit before the event started about the TSEP project, uh, Texas Clean Energy Project, which was a very promising carbon capture project that went pretty far down the road in Texas. And at the end of the day, DOE pulled the plug on it. It was not meeting their milestones in a timely fashion. I'm sure Chris will if, if you want, we'll give you a good storyline about what, the decisions he made and, and uh, why they were well supported. And if you ask my friends at TSEP, they'd tell you a different story. I, sitting here, honestly, won't, you know, pretend that I know what the answer to that is. I would just emphasize, how, you know, how difficult these questions are. Um, and on the Petronova question as well, you know, we highlight Petronova as a su successful project, and I do that. In, in you know many many meetings that I do, I, I think it's a great project. I met Chris out at Petronova about a year ago. As I think you you mentioned in your remarks, Chris, you ask the NRG people, they say, sure, we can build Petronova number two for thirty percent less. That's a great story, right? Where's Petronova two? It's not happening right now. So that you know that highlights another part of the problem here, which is that we don't have the policy context that's driving these additional investments and these. The policy context and the politics on these things obviously change, and that's part of the problem with these, you know, highly capital-intensive, 
long-term development energy projects, you know, the politics change, the markets change while they're underway, and it's difficult to chart a course that uh, carries you clearly through those changing circumstances. That's obviously, you know, the Sinfuel story has been, has been alluded to. So let, having, having been a critic for a few minutes, let me just offer a few slightly more positive alternatives <coughs> to consider. You know, one, I would just say, make a plug for what I think uh, is potentially an important approach to work around this, um, the problem of, you know, DOE picking winners and then having to pull the plug on them, making these judgments that we're involved in future gen and all these other things. Um, I, I would make a plug for what I call self-activating uh, financing mechanisms for these things. And so what I mean would be, you know, tax credits of the type uh, that we talk about in the carbon capture world uh, for, for 45Q is the tax provision that, that we've been advocating for an expansion of. And so um, if 45Q tax credits were available for carbon capture projects at an expanded level from what we have now, you could have companies deciding to go out and identify the specific projects that they think you know, are most viable and demonstrating these new technologies without the people at DOE saying, you know, making judgments about the particular merits of the project, and either they can bring it home or they can't. And so, you know, that mechanism works a little better for, pro for technologies that are closer to commercialization and, you know, less first-of-a-kind demonstration, but, but I think there's uh, potential in that concept. Um, another way I would, another tool that I think is worth thinking about is the idea of reverse auctions, the idea that you want to be putting money out there for these projects. This could be used in coordinate, in, as a complement to the kind of tax credit concept. You want to be making money available to these companies to demonstrate these technologies, but you don't want to give them more than they need. How do you know what they need? Well, it's hard to say, but if you have multiple vendors that are, would like to demonstrate a technology, having them bid for the least amount of public support that they need to bring the project home might be one way of bringing some market forces to play in this space. Um, I would also just emphasize that I think, you know, the lack of policy context and political cohesion on these questions in this country, you know, we, we really should be aware of how important that is. And despite the widespread despair at bridging those gaps, I still think actually it's possible and that, and that we could come together with a more coherent, long-term, bipartisan vision for climate and energy po policy in this country. And I do think that's important to these technology demonstration questions. The kind of classic exam example I'm thinking of would be the Mountaineer project, which, you know, AEP, one of the, our big electric utilities, went out there and pioneered this carbon capture project, but then they weren't allowed to rate base it because there wasn't a CCS, uh, I'm sorry, there wasn't a carbon, you know, policy framework that supported rate basing that. And so, you know, AEP um, pulled the plug on that project, not because it was a technical failure, but because there wasn't the policy context to support it. Um, and so that does bring me back to the political question, which, which I started with, uh, which, you know, David suggests um, we, we need to find ways to insulate uh, these projects from politics. And, and again, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, but I would say also, I think we need to kind of look directly at the political dialogue itself and how to kind of take some of the poison out of it. Um, so one, one you know, line that I've offered to people in this space for many years now is that we should be trying to separate the babies from the bathwater, acknowledging how difficult it is to distinguish which is which. But many of my friends in the innovation community, and, I, and I've had this argument in this room with some of them, uh, think there is no bathwater, that it's all baby. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> that, you know, speaking as somewhat as the, you know, conservative uh, end of this panel, I would say, uh, that's a difficult storyline, and so um, you know, telling Republicans that we just need you know a hundred more cylindras and we'll get we'll get it home, and that, that's just a cost of doing business, has not been an approach that has depressurized the political environment and brought people together. And so I think a little bit more of a willingness to talk honestly about the the challenges in this space, the failures, the you know, successes, the difficult judgment calls might help us bridging some of that political gap. So that, I think that's what Great. I thought for now. Thanks, Sam. We'll do a few minutes of kind of discussion with the panel and then uh, after that to open it up to questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, I mean, let me start with a, just kind of a very basic question. We've talked about in these large-scale demonstration projects about the problems of technical risk, the problems of market risks, the problems of 
policy risks and the difficulty of juggling all these, yet when the federal government for underlying social policy reasons wants to push a technological transformation, you know, is there really any alternative? So the question for our group here, I think, is do we really con need to continue to do demonstration projects at scale? And succinctly, what are a couple of reasons why we need to continue to do that? Because I think that's the thrust of the points that, that you all are all making. Let me turn first to David, but then work our way through the panel. Yeah, so I think the paper says I think we do need to do these projects. And um, the reason the federal government has to play a role is um, that it's achieving a social objective that is blocked by a whole range of um, economic, cultural, um, institutional forces. So if we're going to change, and this is your book, Bill, so I'm, I know I'm preaching to the converted here. Uh, if you're going to change a system that's been around for 100 years, um, it, it takes more than a little nudge. It takes a real push. And this is a crucial phase, I think, for um, you know, getting many large-scale technologies kind of over the hump where they have the potential to be to be deployed, and there really uh, is an alternative to some public support. Um, yeah, I'm a little more optimistic about mobilizing regions and states, but I I take your point very well, Sam, that there is a limit, and you know they're not going to they're not going to fund for you know nuclear design demonstrations. Uh, so that 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 would be just a I think a part of the portfolio, and, and in the end, there has to be a federal component. Joe, I I think we covered this in the presentation, but let me just try and very succinctly summarize it. I think there's technical reasons for doing demonstrations, both for and David discussed this the the need to scale up and the complexity of operating at a higher, larger scale, as well as the point I was trying to make earlier about the feedback loop that you learn from these things that then influence your research agenda. Secondly, there's financial reasons. Obviously, um, uh, these projects are larger than the financial risk that any one company is willing to undertake. And then lastly, there's policy reasons, whether it's to, um, I think the, the, the policy rationale for government intervention is twofold, either one, to try and accelerate what would otherwise take place in the marketplace, or secondly, to move the market in a different direction based on some policy objective. And Chris, you had to actually manage these, so you've got an important perspective here. Yeah, so there's, um, you know, a couple of, of points with the raise that you know that Sam raised in, in his in his comments about, um, you know, how do you, how do you manage these things, and how do you how do you how do you insulate yourself from some of the the political pressure. Um, so there, there's been a kind of interesting evolution over the past, you know, many years as as kind of Congress has in many ways moved away from explicit earmarks. Because in, in a way that when you have an earmark, you know, Congress comes and says, you spend this money on that, right? And it's it's kind of simple, but it's also direct, right? I mean, you're, there's some transparency around that decision because, you know, if you're the executive branch, you execute the law and Congress writes it and you, you do as you're told in those cases. Um, it becomes, you know, the situation's become a little bit more muddled you know, recently in, in, in many ways. Uh, you know, as we were making decisions around the, the Texas Clean Energy Project, TSEP, uh, that, that you mentioned in your, in your, your comments, uh, you, know, the, you know, the way that we manage these projects is you, you, get a, a, you, know, you get money for the project and you allocate it to the, to the project as they meet particular milestones. And there's a discussion around what a milestone is, when you've met it, when you haven't met it, you know, so, you know, in the TSEP project, we got to the point where we said, well, we're not satisfied with these milestones. We, we don't think this project is, is, uh, is moving forward uh, in the way it should be moving, and, and we cut off funding for the project. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of stakeholders out there who were very, very unhappy about that decision. And, you know, you find, well, I found myself at a hearing with, a, you know, a single witness hearing where I was the only witness. And you're getting a lot of questions around that particular decision. Uh, and again, there's no earmark that says you must do this particular thing. But I mean, the, the tone of the thing is, hey, you know, assistant secretary, you know, nice budget. I'd hate for something to happen to it. And they don't. <laughs> they, and that's the, the tone of, of the discussion. Um, but I think you can make good decisions. I mean, I, I think you can 
in projects that, that, that aren't operating. Um, and that's, again, that, that's a, a difficult thing to do, but I think that the transparency around those processes, um, I, I think the transparency around the hearings is a, is a useful thing to help push accountability to, to, co to government decision makers. And Sam, should we continue to do demos? I do think we should. Um, you know, as I suggested, I would like uh, self-activating financing mechanisms so it's a little bit less of, of the bright boys in DOE making these decisions and more of the market. Um, but but uh, I do think these demonstration programs are important one way or another. Um, and I would particularly focus on, you know, the need for demonstration programs for these highly capital-intensive technologies. I think, you know, it's a lot easier for markets to build, um, you know, just much smaller things. A lot of renewable technologies aren't, aren't as capital intensive. But you want to get to advanced nuclear, you want to make CCS really work. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen just in the private sector, at least absent the policy framework that would you know, incentivize them to do so, such as carbon constraints. Great. I mean, let me ask one more. Um, one thing which, which each of you really kind of raised, are, and Joe, you led off with this, frankly, do we have adequate tools for the policy follow-on once a demonstration has been, shall we say, demonstrated. And wh what kinds of things do we need to think about in that tool set? And, you know, Sam, you've, you've raised some kind of upfront ideas about sharing. David, you raised some um, industry stake sliding scale cost sharing ideas. But succinctly, what are some of the core ideas that we could think about to ensure that given all this risk, that there's actually going to be a policy follow-on? Maybe you want to start off? Well, I guess I wouldn't use the word insure, right? So, Excuse me. Yeah, so <laughs> the idea is to increasingly put them to the, to the market test, and you want to be reducing the subsidy as technologies mature. But I think many of the tools have been mentioned, the tax incentives, um, in some cases uh, procurement, government procurement, uh, where DOD is the biggest um, um, budget in town. Um, the loan program, I think, could be important, and unfortunately, it seems to be being sacrificed uh, this year, so that could be a major loss if that uh, goes through. So I think there are a lot of tools there. Uh, again, I, I don't know that you can – you don't want to deploy them so that you ensure, you know, success. Um, but the risk isn't all gone after the demonstration project. And um, in some cases, depending on what's happened in the five or ten years that it took to do the demonstration, some of the risks may rise. So, um, so I do think you need the tool set um, available. Joe? Yeah, it it's a, would be some combination of uh, uh, further financial incentives and I think I mentioned the word time limited so that there's some clear pathway exit from those or uh, some form of a regulatory or other mandate. I, I do want to mention the loan program in particular because I think that is a potentially useful tool here. Um, and uh, use the example of um, utility scale photovoltaics where uh, photovoltaics had been demonstrated but that really the, the, the market application and, and really the a lot of the further learning in terms of cost reduction and um, uh, performance uh, cost reduction took place in the, in uh, as a result of the loan program being the source of financing for the first round of utility scale PV projects, and there was a lot learned from those, and it did a lot to stimulate the entire industry, and so it really took something that from a demonstration phase to something that. Uh, it was much more uh, competitive in the marketplace. So, and Chris, as you ran some of these, were there some particular arrows you wish you had in your quiver on follow-on to the demonstration right. projects right. that could have been useful? Well, one of the things that the department did you know, over the last several years was to stand up the Office of, of Technology Transfer and 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 staff that that office that really explicitly thinks about. Now, how do you take the things that you're learning in the laboratory? How do you think take the the best practices that come out of the demonstrations, and ensure that you you disseminate that that information and that knowledge broadly enough that the you can have the types of, of follow-on projects that you'd like to see after the demos. Um, Sometimes the follow-up and the the uh, the benefits come in ways that, that 
that you don't inspect in some in, in some cases. You know, one of the questions you asked was, you know, where is the you know the next Petronova? You know, Petronova we see as being a project that that actually you know stuck the landing in terms of timeliness and and, and budget. But where's the next one? And and I I'd, I'd say that one of the there's a couple things we we'll learned from from Petronova. You know, we learned a little bit about scaling. We learned a little bit about uh, um, um, bringing together uh, um, all the 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 pieces of of the of the project and creating a, a single uh, a single project, but we're also we'll learn a little bit about the commercial modules that drive a project like Petronova, where someone has to capture the CO2, someone has to build the pipeline, someone has to compress it and move it to the the field, and there's a lot of market failures that are in place that are keeping projects like this from going forward, and I I'd, I'd submit that the, probably the next Petronova will probably look a little different from Petronova. I mean, it you could capture CO2. Uh, at a lower cost from industrial sources like a, a gas processing plant, uh, a refinery, some some chemical plants. I mean, there are other sources of, of natural gas, uh, of sorry, of CO2 that might be captured at a at a cost that doesn't involve the big capital investment that that uh, NRG made at Petronova. But the fact that you have a, a project that's up and operating and put all of these commercial pieces together, that 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 tied the investment in capture with an investment in pipeline, with the regulatory stuff you have to move the CO2 from point A to point B, with the sales and purchase agreement to put, move the CO2 to a field. You'll use that insight in ways that might not be a, you know, Petronova, it's not going to be son of Petronova, but it's going to be something else that, that incorporates some of that commercial learning. I think that on top of the technological learning is, is a really important part of moving the technologies forward. Interesting point. So keep in mind commercial implementation as part of the demonstration itself, not just technical demonstration. Indeed. And in fact, I, I think that's probably one of the most important right. parts of, of this particular Petronova project. Sam, closing thoughts on this point? Yeah. I, I would just start by especially echoing the point that Chris just made. I think what's important about Petronova, what's interesting, is partly the technology, but the technology itself is not that innovative. What is really innovative about the project is the commercial financing and the way they put the business model together. And so I do think that projects like that are very important in demonstrating innovative business models and, and helping people figure out how to do these things. Um, just the one other point I may, I'll make on this, I think I've said most of what I have to say, but uh, I will make a plug for you know my previous work on institutional reform at DOE. I think the last administration made a couple of good steps forward. We've talked about some of those today, but I would, I would make a plug for breaking the organizational stovepipes at DOE in a fundamental way that has not been done. I want to get rid of Chris's previous job. <laughs> we should not have an assistant secretary for fossil. We should have an assistant secretary for power generation who is charged with making a decision about all the power generation technologies out there and so that it is easier to make objective, analytically based decisions about should we be demonstrating the next CCS technology or the next advanced nuclear technology or the next advanced storage technology or whatever it may be. I think thinking about our needs in those terms rather than these technologically siloed uh, frameworks right, might in some might ways be that better. drives too to, to Joe's point about a common project management capability yes, that gets shared. Right, exactly. So let's exactly. open this up now to the, uh, to the audience for some Q&A from the audience. <clears throat> And there's a microphone that's going to come around. Uh, let me, Dr. Van Atta here in the front. Yeah, I'm Dick Van Atta from the Institute for Defense Analyses in Georgetown University. And uh, I'd like to ask, first of all, uh, when you think of designing successful energy demonstration projects, does that just mean aiming lower? I mean, what is, do we really do want to focus on just success in that sense, or what is our approach for strategically organizing these around a portfolio of successes, if you will. Uh, that raises a question of understanding the vision of the process relative to things like prototyping, experimentation, and demonstration, the interrelationships amongst those. Uh, DOD is not much better at this, by the way, than DOE in understanding these relationships and how these fit together in an organized mechanism. If you ask what was the DOD success of a similar scale of demonstration, uh, what was truly a demonstration, you might say, well, okay, the Manhattan Project, but that wasn't a demonstration. That was, a, you will succeed no matter how much money we throw at it. Uh, you think of something like the DARPA uh, assault breaker program as an example of a true demonstration, which was basically integration of prototypes. Uh, that shows you a set of examples 
but there was a lot of analytics underlying that and an awful lot of development of the sub-tiers under that. So I think one of the things I see missing from this is a strategy for demonstration that relies on the interrelationships amongst those, which may go to a couple of the points about the interrelationships amongst the R&D, technology development, and the implementation worlds that I think needs to be further fleshed out. And I would say if you look at DOD as a mechanism for doing that, you're not going to find that integration model there either. So responses? I guess I'd say maybe that's an argument for maintaining the silos up to a point. And, you know, I don't know. And I actually really like Joe's suggestion of thinking about a, for these mature technologies, a kind of more generic organization. But I think a lot of the, the, the phases can be quite specific to the technology. And, you know, the, how many stages do you need to scale up through uh, may vary from technology to technology. And that may be an argument for keeping, um, uh, the applied energy structure to some extent, but maybe you know, ramping back um, its downstream components and, and keep and putting those together into a more generic organization. But I do think there is a need for for subject matter experts in these technologies to you know answer the the interrelation um, issue. Chris, you got a thought on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a, a comment. Um, so I, I'll I'll touch a, a, a bit on your your comment on. On failure, success, you know how we think about uh, how we even think about those comments. And uh, uh, Dr. Van Adam and I actually had a little, little bit of sidebar earlier on some collaboration between DOE and DO and Department of Defense. Uh, there was an MOU signed, I think, back in 2010 that was an energy collaboration between DoD and DOE. Um, and you know that that was a steering team that I always felt didn't really work that well. We get a bunch of of senior people in the room, and folks would come in and give presentations. And everybody nod their head, and at the end we'd say, "Hey, that was great. Let's do it again." And um, but the and, and as as a person who was kind of involved in the steering team, I always felt, "Well, you know, how could we be more strategic? Like, what is it? What is it we need to do to 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 capture this awesome synergy between you know DoD and, and DOE?" But part of the the value of that, which I, I might not have appreciated at the moment, was just having having those uh, those technologists come in and present to you know a bunch of generals in a room. Gives them the top cover to to collaborate and and to fail or succeed, right? But if, if you're if you don't if you don't feel like you've got the support of your your organization as a as a whole to go out and do difficult things, then you're going to make sure that you do things that allow you to bring back a successful report card. Um, you know when we you know we had a, a comment on the the Solyndra um, uh, uh, loan, right? And which is you know always comes up in the in these conversations as it does. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the loan guarantee program as a whole over the last couple of years, I mean, I think a critis criticism of the loan guarantee program is that it was actually too successful in a way. I mean, you, you I mean, if, if all the loans that you're making, you know, if your goal is to make sure you get paid back on every single cent and that your report card is, is, percent, uh, is a percent success, then it might turn into a situation that means that you're just, you're poaching loan activity from the private sector, doing things that would have happened any, and otherwise, and you're not really you know, having the audacity to go out and incentivize some some technologies that would not have been pushed forward without government intervention. So uh, it's it's hard to talk about failures. In fact, it's it's I probably talk more about Kemper in public right now than I've ever done before because you don't talk about those things when you're managing them. But um, the idea of what failure and success means in the in the world of innovation, I think, is a, is a complex thing. If I can make uh, three quick points. First is that I think when all of us are talking about being more successful with uh, demonstration projects, we're not we're talking about the execution. We're not necessarily saying dumb down the project or take less risk up front, um, but we're just saying manage it better. Secondly, I think I agree with the point. I think you were making in your question that there needs to be a, a kind of a overall strategy here and in particular two things one is there needs to be uh, a very thorough and thoughtful assessment of technical readiness for a technology to go to demonstration which takes into account the points you're making about prototyping and whatnot but also the point I think that uh, Sam was making earlier that the policy context that if you're going to move forward with a demonstration project that it's being done within an appropriate uh, policy context. 
And then the third point I would just make, again, going back to the point I made earlier and others have commented on, I think there are opportunities to manage these projects better on a cross-technology basis. And we have actually two, I think, good empirical working models within a department. One is RPE, which does fund a lot of research across a wide variety of technologies and fuels. And the other one is the loan program, which also, in its uh, activities, has a portfolio that spans multiple technology areas. So I think that model is working in those two areas, and I think it can be made to work in the demonstration project area as well. Thanks. Let's have, we have time now for <coughs> one more question from the audience. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Hugh Ho. I'm at the U.S. Department of Energy and the Energy Policy Office. Um, thank you for the discussion um, this morning. Um, I'd like to talk more or hear your thoughts about uh, the international context for demonstration projects since I didn't hear much pushback on David's initial point that there doesn't seem to be uh, much initial um, or immediate prospects for additional demos here in the U.S. But we know that internationally for many of these same technologies that uh, the, the, there are projects that are proceeding, um, both siting and funding. Um, and I'm wondering whether you have thoughts about how DOE or the U.S. in general should approach um, that, uh, uh, how to best uh, uh, advance our objectives given this international context. Panel? I think it's a weakness in the paper. I mean, I, I think that's a very fair uh, point. Um, I'm not sure that the, you know, the budget is going to be more forthcoming for international uh, projects than, um, than domestic ones, though. So. Um, I, I would worry about that, but I do think, um, especially the, the really big technologies that we're talking about, are more likely to have their um, applications overseas, you know, on the kind of scale. And it would be very good for U.S. industry to be a part of that. And it's not clear to me that the U.S. industry can be a part of that without some domestic uh, projects as well. So I think there is some um, you know, positive feedback between the two. But but I do think the U.S. ought to be. Uh, uh, exercising more leadership. Actually, I was surprised in the assessment, at least Howard Herzog from MIT's assessment of carbon capture, that actually the U.S. is the leading country, and that kind of shows you the rest of the world is not um, pulling, you know, pulling its weight. And now in nuclear, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Um, so, so Joe is a CFO who had to oversee the famed Eater Fusion <laughs> International <laughs> Cooperation. I, I was, I was yeah. hoping that way you come up. In this yeah. step. That's research, right? No, I, all, all I will just say is <clears throat> you can see certain uh, virtues in having an international um, demonstration or, as David was saying, having a domestic demonstration to set the stage for a um, – um, uh, international deployment. Uh, but it, there's a whole host of other issues that come up. And the biggest one being uh, the, the fact that the where the project will be built, because I think we have uh, many in Congress who welcome international participation as long as the project is built in the U.S. Uh, and then the other problem is as well uh, the governance issue is a, is a huge issue. And some of the questions that we talked about here about managing risks and exit strategies and being nimble, those problems are complicated uh, uh, by orders of magnitude when you have international participation. One, uh, one, one approach, which is, doesn't satisfy all the, the drivers here, but this idea of designing uh, counterfacing projects with collaborators in, in other countries where you know, you've, we've, the U.S. would have a you know, a project in the U.S., uh, another country would have a, a, a project elsewhere. And you have an exchange of, of data and information and scientific resources so that um, um, you get insights from both. So it doesn't give you all the synergies of working together on one thing, but, again, the, the complexity of taking a, you know, a U.S. taxpayer dollar to build a widget somewhere outside of our borders is, is, uh, can be prohibitively difficult. Sam, further thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with what I've already heard. I, I would just highlight that I think the uh, the cooperation versus competition aspects of this international these uh, partnerships is very difficult, and that is that is I think one of the main challenges. Um, and I would just add, you know, I think my friends who've served in DOE would probably agree. A, a lot of the time, these international kind of 
you know, agreements that uh, are struck between DOE and the counterparts in other countries, they arise because, you know, some foreign minister is coming to the States and they want to have a photo op and it's a lot of kind of feel good, hold hands stuff. It doesn't, it's not a serious plan that's embedded within a larger, longer term framework. And I just, you know, these things are often very ad hoc and I think the more we can take them seriously and look for the kind of analytical basis that Joe had suggested we should have for these decisions in the international arena, you know, the better our chances are right. anyways. So it'll be time for you all to approach the panelists, uh, but we're past our webcast time and I just wanted to thank our terrific panel very much.